Hi there, welcome to Cornerstone Fellowship's Christmas service. I'm so glad you're here. We got the team here behind us and to get ready for a great hour full of Christmas music, some traditional stuff, some new stuff. We'll open the scriptures as we read the Christmas story and then we'll end by lighting a candle at the end of the service. So get ready for that as we join our hearts and our spirits across the miles, across the time zone. So look around your space for perhaps a candle that you can light along with us. But now, please turn up your speakers, or if you're by yourself, turn up your headphones. And on behalf of everyone here at CF Online, Merry Christmas. Oh, come let us adore Him. Oh, come so much singing those words this season. Oh, come let us adore. This, um, the word specifically adore, this feeling of adoration, this reverence and admiration and love for this baby that came to earth to provide hope and peace and comfort and this redemption story, this rescue. And I love the word come because it's this invitation to, to come and see, to come and know. And maybe for some of you today, you don't know Jesus um, and you don't have that relationship with him. And that's totally fine. I was once that person. I spent so many Christmases not knowing who Jesus was. I didn't experience this, this light or this peace and this, these words that we're singing today, the child prays for peace on earth, calling out from a sea of hurt, that was me. And maybe that's you today. And so I'm extending the invitation to you to come and to know and to see. There is a king that adores you and his name is Jesus and he loves you and cares for you. He is a provider of hope. He is a provider of peace. He is the Prince of Peace. He is love. And he's calling out to you now. And so again, if you're that person today, I extend that invitation to you to join this family of believers 
these people that walk this earth that um, are filled with hope. And maybe you are someone that knows Jesus and this season is so difficult for you. I wanna remind you of Emmanuel, God with us. God is with you in this season of heartbreak or loss or pain or grief. He's with you. So as we sing this song and we give glory to God, just know God knows and sees for all who are waiting, for all those that are praying, God sees and hears and he loves you so much. Glory to the light of the world. For a miracle The heart longs for a little bit of hope Oh come, oh come Emmanuel The child prays for peace on earth And she's calling out from a sea of hurt Oh come, oh come
I know it's, it's a little strange to not be doing a Christmas song right now. You know, one of those traditional Christmas hymns that we normally sing. But you know, as a worship leader, I often find that the moment we remember why Christ was born is siloed to one time a year. When December hits and Advent starts, that's when we remember the birth of our Savior. And then Easter rolls around and we remember why he died for us. And my hope today, our hope today as, as a team, as a church, is for us to remember the hope that was born on that day, but also for that hope to carry with us for the rest of the year. You see, when we sing these Christian, you know, Christmas songs, when we sing these worship songs throughout the year, they are saying almost the same exact thing. They're celebrating Jesus. They're reminding us of the hope that Jesus brings. And it wasn't just on the day that he was born. It was throughout the days of his ministry. It was on the day that he was on the cross. Even in that bleak moment, we saw hope. We saw redemption. We saw love. We saw grace. And my prayer is that we can take that with us throughout the entire year. And we see these relationships between singing that he is our way maker, our miracle worker, our promise keeper, but he's also the light. He's the light of the world and he is forever worthy, forever worthy of our praise. So we're gonna continue to worship. And I pray that we see the connections through each of these Christmas songs and the worship songs we sing all throughout the year. You are here, moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, working in this place. I worship you. I worship you. I sing, you are here. You are here. Moving in our midst, I worship you, I worship you. You are here, working in this place. I worship you, oh, I worship you, yeah.
let's celebrate. Let's tell it on the mountain. Let's tell everyone that Jesus Christ is born. Come on. Go tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain, Jesus Christ is born. While shepherds camp there watching, or silent flocks by night, behold shown a holy light. Go tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain, Jesus Christ is born. The shepherd Amongst the stars, suddenly a bright new star appeared. Of all the stars in the dark world to heaven, this one so clear. It blazed in the night and made the other stars look pale beside it. God put it there when his baby son was born to be like a spotlight, shining on him, lighting up the darkness, showing people the way to him. You see, God was like a new daddy. He couldn't keep the good news to himself. He's been waiting these long years for this moment, and now he wanted to tell everyone. So he pulled out the stops. He set an angel to tell Mary the good news. He put a special star in the sky to show where his boy was, and now he is going to send a big choir of angels to sing his happy song to the world. He's here, he's here. Go and see him, my little boy. Now, where would you s- send your splendid core? To maybe a concert hall, maybe, or pl- perhaps a palace? God sent his to a little hillside, outside a little town in the middle of the night. He sent all those angels to sing for a raggedy old bunch of shepherds watching their sheep outside Bethlehem. In those days, remember people used to laugh at the shepherds and say that they were smelly and call them other rude names, which I can't possibly mention here. You see, people thought shepherds were nobody, just scruffy old riffraff. God must have thought that the shepherds were very important indeed because they are the ones 
He chose to tell the good news to first. The night some shepherds were out in the open fields, warming themselves by a campfire, when suddenly a sh the sheep darted. They were frightened by something. The olive trees rustled. What was that? A wing beat? They, t it, they turned around, standing in front of them. It was a huge warrior of light, blazing in the darkness. Don't be afraid of me, the bright shining man said. I haven't come to hurt you. I've come to bring you happy news for everyone, everywhere. Today, in David's town in Bethlehem, God's son has been born. You can go see him. He's sleeping in a manger. Behind the angel, they saw a strange glowing cloud, except it wasn't a cloud. It was an angel. It was angels, troops and troops of angels armed with light. And they were singing a beautiful song. Glory to God. Glory to God. To God be fame. To God be fame. And honor and all our hoorays. Our hoorays. As quickly as they appeared, the angels left. The shepherds stamped out their fire, left their sheep, raced down that grassy hill, through the gates of Bethlehem, down a, down, down a narrow cobble street, through a courtyard, down some steps, 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 past an inn, round a corner, through a hedge, until at last they reached a tumble-down stable. They caught their breath and they quietly tiptoed inside. They knelt on the dirt floor. They had heard this about this promised child, and now he was here, heaven's son, the maker of stars, a baby sleeping in his mother's arms. The baby would be like the bright star shining in the sky that night. A light to light up the world, taking away darkness, helping people to see. And the darker the night got, the brighter the star would shine. Merry Christmas, and open your Bibles to Luke chapter 2, where God comes through on promises he had been making since the book of Genesis. Let's read together uh, Luke 2, starting in verse 1. At that time, the Roman Emperor Augustus decreed that a, a census should be taken throughout the Roman Empire. This was the first census taken when Quirinius was governor of Syria. All returned to their own ancestral towns to register for the census. And because Joseph was a descendant of King David, he had to go to Bethlehem in Judea, David's ancient home. He traveled there from the village of Nazareth in Galilee. He took with him Mary, his fiancee, who was now obviously pregnant. Yeah, and the final week of a woman's pregnancy is not the ideal time for her to go on a long journey, but uh, they had no choice. There would be trouble for anyone who asked for an exception to a decree like this one coming from an emperor who wanted to count heads and assess yet another tax. Now with this census, the Romans required everyone to register in the village of their family origins, so Joseph, who traced his lineage back to King David, helped his very pregnant wife pack her things, and they headed south to Bethlehem. God's plan all along had been for Jesus to be born, not in Nazareth, where Mary and Joseph lived, but in Bethlehem, the city of David. It was 700 years previous when a prophet named Micah wrote these words. Bethlehem, though you are small, out of you will come the one who will be ruler over Israel. His origins are from old, from, from ancient times. So that was the plan. So God created the circumstances, giving Joseph no choice but to go to Bethlehem. It was by far the most uncomfortable trip Mary had ever taken. And from the very beginning, we witness the stress, the inconvenience, and the discomfort good people often endure as God works his perfect plan through his chosen ones. The angel had told Mary that she was favored. 
But that didn't mean life was gonna be easy for her. But then again, this was Mary, the most amazing teenager in human history. You know, when you think of it, she was the first person to accept Christ, uh, accepting him into her body. I wonder when she put it together that she was the virgin Isaiah had promised the nation, the woman who would supernaturally conceive and give birth to Emmanuel, whose name means God is with us now. That announcement from Gabriel was initially a shocker, uh, but Mary handled it all with unbelievable grace. Uh, her response was, I'm the Lord's servant, she said. Let everything God has planned for me happen. Where does a teenage girl get that kind of faith? A girl from Nazareth who quotes the Psalms as if she's a rabbi, quoting them word for word in a new Psalm that she writes and recites to Elizabeth. I praise God, she said, because he took notice of me. From now on, all generations will call me blessed because the mighty one has done great things for me. But along with the unmatched honor of accepting God's plan for her, came a much more difficult path. Being favored by God, being chosen to be part of his plan, doesn't spare you painful trials. It actually often means your life becomes more difficult. It did for Mary and Joseph. Think of them there in Nazareth. Think of them on that road to Bethlehem, and even, Beth even in Bethlehem, uh, they were very much alone. Her family and friends assumed that Mary's pregnancy was something to be, something to be ashamed of uh, instead of something to celebrate. Here they were, fully cooperating with God's plan, but still they were very much alone. It cost them dearly. You know, right there, we have to stop because some of you had a similar experience when you said yes to God's plan for your life. I was just in Colorado laying my father to rest in the cemetery where scores of my relatives are buried, including my grandpa Joe. My mom has told me the story of how her dad was so angry when mom came home from that Young Life camp saying that she wanted to follow after Jesus. It became a very lonely time for her in that home. You know, I bet there are people who are joining us today who could say that your life became more difficult once you said yes to Jesus. Is that you? Let us know. Let us know if you feel alone. We want to be your family. We want to affirm your calling and your decision to follow Jesus with us. All right, back to the prophet, uh, Micah this time, who wrote, Israel will feel abandoned until the time when she is in labor, gives birth. And it's true. At the time of Christ's birth, Israel did feel abandoned. They had felt abandoned for 400 years since the last words of Malachi and then God's silence. And, and, and in their day, God had allowed the Romans to rule over them. And in today's text, as Rome levied yet another tax, no doubt the Jews wondered why God was allowing this. Luke tells us it was in those days. It was those days that God's son arrived on planet Earth. And even though God's people felt abandoned, he'd been working behind the scenes all along. When Mary and Joseph were forced to travel to Bethlehem, Caesar Augustus thought he was in charge. He wasn't. Mary had said it well in her song back in chapter one, my soul proclaims the greatness of the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God, my savior. He has scattered the proud because of the intentions of their hearts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones while lifting up the humble. And it was the prophet Micah who described Mary's son as a humble shepherd. This one will stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. His greatness will reach to the ends of the earth and he will be their peace. He will be their peace, Micah writes. He won't bring peace, he will be 
peace. He won't bring good news. He will be good news. He will be a strong shepherd to a flock of vulnerable sheep. That's us. That's who we are. And our shepherd is watching over us even today. All right, back to Mary and Joseph who arrive at Bethlehem, a village packed to the gills with other descendants of David who had also come to register in the census. There was no suitable space available for this expectant couple. Not that turning Mary and Joseph away would have been easy for the locals. Middle Eastern hospitality is the warmest welcome in the world. You simply make room for guests. But in Bethlehem, there was absolutely no room left. Except, well, a very humble place. Uh, most homes uh, had a place for the animals, usually a part of the house, a lean-to shed, uh, the first floor underneath where the people lived, uh, a small stable where your donkey, your, your goats, your, your chickens were gathered every night. So someone offered a space like this to Joseph. It wasn't ideal. It wasn't sanitary. Probably didn't smell that great but it was private and it was safe. In this humble environment, Joseph delivered Mary's son, the son of the Most High, and she swaddled the newborn baby tightly in the clean cloth she had brought. Then she gently laid him in a manger, a trough for feeding livestock. Now I'm sure Mary and Joseph would not have chosen this location to give birth to the savior of the world but it was what God had provided. The manger was God's choice, a cradle, a cradle that communicates volumes, an extremely humble crib for the King of Kings to spend his first night on planet Earth, making Jesus a most unusual God, a humble God. Who ever heard of a humble God? We don't often ponder God as being humble, mainly because we don't seem to understand humility. God can't be humble because, well, he's so awesome, he's so powerful. But God reveals his true nature in his son Jesus and come to find out, God is humble. Choosing in Jesus to arrive without fanfare, living his life on earth, raised by parents of simple means. As an adult even, Jesus lived day to day. No home, no wife, no cash in his pocket. It seems that all Jesus ever owned, he carried in a knapsack. Hmm. Let's go back to Bethlehem where in verse eight, we read this. That night, there were shepherds staying in the fields nearby, guarding their flocks of sheep. These shepherds were not far from the most amazing event that had ever happened. The manger where the Son of God napped was just a stone's throw away. God had arrived, but these shepherds didn't know it yet. You know, each year in the, in the churches I grew up in, the kids put on a Christmas pro program, a, a pageant we call it, uh, those of us chosen to be the shepherds, uh, we wore fake beards and bathrobes and small towels draped on our heads because, well, this is how we pictured shepherds. It wasn't until I was in Israel, in fields near Bethlehem, that I saw actual shepherds. And the biggest surprise was this. The shepherds were not grown men with beards. They were mainly kids. Well, there was an adult or two sprinkled in, but for the most part, the sheep were guided by children as young as eight or nine, along with a few older brothers and sisters. In all my trips to the Holy Land, I've only seen young people tending to their family's sheep. And this has been true since that first Christmas Eve and, and even before that. I mean, remember the boy David? In these same Bethlehem fields, David was the youngest of his family, so he was stuck with the long, boring hours of watching over the sheep. On the night Jesus was born, shepherd kids and possibly a few adults were camping in the fields. 
They were out in the fields, uh, and this phrase tells us that it most likely was not December when uh, Christ was born. December is when the weather is the coldest. It can even snow in those fields. Uh, the sheep are brought in uh, into caves and small fires uh, keep them warm. No, it was, it was probably October. This is when the lambs are born and the shepherds are out in the fields all night delivering the babies and protecting the exhausted mothers from predators. Lambing season means long hours for the shepherds, but it's also a good time for the family economically because when your herd increased, so does your wealth. These October lambs, they would be ready for sale at Passover. And the best lambs would, be, would bring the, the, the highest prices at the temple just a few miles away. Thanks to the work of a New Testament scholar named Alfred Edersheim, we know that these Bethlehem shepherds were not your run-of-the-mill shepherds. They were really good at what they did. Bethlehem shepherds had made their mark on the world by becoming the number one supplier of perfect lambs for the daily temple sacrifices. Bethlehem lambs were in high demand and used exclusively in the temple ceremonies that called for unblemished, unbruised sacrifices. So in the birthing season, the vulnerable ewes were watched over 24-7, and when that mother was ready to give birth, there was a place near these Bethlehem fields known as Migdal Eider, where the prize ewes were brought to birth their lambs in the arms of skilled shepherds. The newborn lambs wouldn't even hit the ground for fear of bruising. They would gently be swaddled in protective cloth and laid in mangers. Look at verse 9. <clears throat> so the shepherds are in the field, and suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared among them, and the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them. They were terrified, but the angel reassured them. Do not be afraid, he said. I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all the people. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David. And you will recognize him by this sign. You will find a baby wrapped snugly in strips of cloth, lying in a manger. Go into town and find this little lamb. Look for a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and laid carefully in a manger like a lamb at Migdal Eider. Inspect this little lamb with your expert eyes, with your skilled hands. See if this newborn lamb qualifies to be a perfect sacrifice. Verse 13, suddenly the angel was joined by a vast host of others, the armies of heaven, praising God and saying, glory to God in highest heaven and peace on earth to those with whom God is pleased. A host, a heavenly host. What an interesting word choice for our author Luke to use because a host is not a choir, it's a, it's a squadron, a battalion of soldiers, a unit of angelic fighters. But ask yourself, what was an angelic army doing in the Bethlehem fields there that night? Well, the Bible doesn't say. But we were left to assume that a battle had just been won, a cosmic victory. The earth had long been enemy-occupied territory, but now the Son of the Most High had been snuck in and the angels were celebrating his birth. Maybe they were sticking around to protect the baby and his earthly parents. Just like the newborn lambs and their mothers in the fields that night needed protection, maybe Jesus, Mary, and Joseph needed protection as well. We don't know. What we do know is if the dark force forces, the evil spirits that always oppose God's plan, if they could have prevented Christ's birth, they would have. But they failed. And the heavenly host was celebrating. Glory to God in heaven, they chanted, and peace on earth among those whom God is pleased. Peace on earth between God and man. Peace was being restored. Mankind had been at, at war with God and God's purposes. But now the Father had sent his own Son to make peace with us 
and give us favor. The ancient plan of redemption, one that had begun when God made Eve a promise to one day fix the mess she and Adam had made, that plan was hitting a key milestone in Bethlehem. The Lamb of God had arrived. The plan of salvation was being carried out. And that message, delivered by those angels, never gets old. Glory to God in heaven and peace on earth among those whom God, with whom God is pleased. In Christ's birth, God receives the glory and we receive peace. And what great time it is for us to hear that. 2021 has been anything but peaceful. Yet Jesus comes again at the end of this year as the Prince of Peace. And once again, we are offered peace in a season of uncontrollable events. The peace of Christ, which guards our hearts and guards our minds this Christmas. Friends, let the peace of God rule your heart today. Let him guard your heart. Think about how you've been feeling lately. I, I noticed the other day I wasn't even breathing deeply. I was kind of breathing in a shallow way, kind of guarded, maybe just tired. I don't know, but it felt so good to just breathe in the peace of God. I encourage you to do that right now. Let the peace of God guard your heart. Let him guard your mind. All right, let's keep reading. Verse 15. When the angels had returned to heaven, the shepherds said to each other, what was that? <laughs> no, they actually said, well, they probably said that. <clears throat> I don't know what they said other than what Luke tells us. They said, let's go to Bethlehem. Let's see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. They hurried to the village and found Mary and Joseph, and there was the baby lying in the manger. After seeing him, the shepherds told everyone what had happened and what the angel had said to them about this child. All who heard the shepherd's story were astonished. But Mary kept all these things in her heart and thought about them often. The shepherds went back to their flocks, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen. It was just as the angel had told them. Luke's original readers would have been astonished at the story itself, but also absolutely floored by who God chose to be the messengers, the first human beings to meet the Lamb of God who would take away the sins of the world were the very shepherds raising the temple lambs. Shepherds were the first evangelists, the first ones to tell the world that Jesus was there. Now, this is especially amazing because shepherds were kind of at the bottom of the social pecking order. Uh, shepherding sheep, not among the more highly respected trades. Now, back in the Old Testament, being a shepherd was a respectable life. Abraham was a shepherd. Uh, Moses was a shepherd. Isaac was a shepherd. Jacob, all shepherds. The prophets, Amos was a shepherd. David was a shepherd. But by the time Jesus was born, shepherding sheep was the last thing you wanted to do. And in a mean twist of irony, these same Bethlehem shepherds who provided the sacrificial lambs were rarely allowed into the temple grounds to witness the sacrifice. It was their profession itself that kept them ceremonially unclean. They had sheep poop on their sandals. There was too much dirt under their fingernails. They regularly came in contact with blood. So they were kept outside, outside of the holiest places. You know, it's sad, you know, they provided for religion, but they were never invited into religion. That is, until this night of nights, when the angels invited them to come and meet the Son of God personally. Let me ask you, if you were uh, God and the Messiah you had promised for centuries had finally arrived, would you have chosen the shepherd uh, as your only eyewitnesses and evangelists to tell the world that, that Christ was born in Bethlehem? That's what's so great about who God chooses. 
God always selects unlikely people to witness life's most powerful moments. And that makes the Christmas story a little better when the messengers become part of the message. When the unlikely people God chooses to communicate the good news become part of the good news. Because if God chooses them, if God trusts them, then there's hope for us. Unto us, a Savior has been born. Us. You know, even as I say this, I imagine there are some people listening to my voice that feel unqualified to be out there talking about Jesus. You don't feel ready. You don't feel worthy. But friend, Jesus makes you worthy. If God has invited you in, then he's commissioned you to tell the story. All you have to do is start telling people what you've personally experienced with Jesus. Tell your Jesus story, how your life intersected with God's life and changed everything. When you don't feel qualified, remind yourself of the words of the Apostle Paul who wrote, brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. None of you were influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. Hmm. What a great story. The people most needing grace become the best messengers of grace. We've been selected to tell a story not because we are well qualified or well connected or worthy, uh, quite the opposite. God rescues us flawed people because we know how to talk to other flawed people and they can see our flaws. When the world sees that God saved us, God chose us, it gives them hope. Hey, let's go back to verse 19. All this is happening, and then Luke pauses to say, but Mary kept all these things in her heart and thought about them often. One of the translations says, she treasured these things. She pondered these things, and then they became her heart treasures. What a powerful thought. She knew she had conceived God's son, uh, and now she could see God's son. She knew that her son was the savior of the world, but first she and Joseph had to raise him. So on this first Christmas night, she packed it all away in her heart. She comforted her son in that cradle on the first day of his earthly life, but she had no idea that she'd be there at the cross comforting him as he died. What she treasured in her heart that night carried her through from Bethlehem to Calvary to an empty tomb where her son defeated death. Hmm. Stay in Bethlehem, but fast forward to December of 1865. Pastor Philip Brooks, who had been a chaplain in the Civil War, was exhausted at the end of the war that had ripped our nation apart. He had done everything he could, but he needed a sabbatical, so he took a ship and went to the Holy Land. On Christmas Eve, he rode a horse the few miles from Jerusalem through the shepherd's fields and into Bethlehem, where Christian pilgrims were celebrating the birth of Christ. Sometime later, he was back in Philadelphia preparing his Christmas sermon Reflecting on that night in Israel, he wrote the song, O Little Town of Bethlehem, a song that says, the hopes and fears of all the years are met in thee tonight. That's a great thought. <clears throat> a thought we can hold on to as we end this year, and as we light our candles, that Christ came to earth to fulfill our hopes and calm our fears. 
And Jesus, God himself, came to planet Earth to set things right again. Oh, it's been another crazy year, and there's no promises that the next year will be any easier. So I say it'd be wise for us to stay very close to Jesus again this year, allowing him to calm our fears and give us hope. Let me pray that just all of that for you now. <clears throat> Father, I come to you thanking you for Jesus, thanking you for Bethlehem. You didn't have to come to earth. Um, we hadn't done much to honor or worship you since the book of Genesis, and yet you kept your plan in play, not because of our behavior, but because of your love. And Father, here now, we celebrate that love. Jesus coming to earth gives us hope. Jesus living, on, living here and living not in wealth, but in poverty, <clears throat> suffering all the things that we suffer. Lord, we thank you for Jesus who lived an amazing life and explained you to us, explained the scriptures to us. In doing so, he took on powerful enemies who eventually nailed him to a cross. But then again, that was part of your plan too. And Lord, we thank you for that Sunday morning that we'll soon be celebrating on Easter where Jesus not only defeated death, but opened up heaven to us. Father, between now and heaven, we have this life to live, and I think you know it hasn't been easy for us. The things you've allowed to happen have been tough for us this year. We know you can look into the next year and, and see what's going to be great and what's going to be difficult. And Lord, for our part, we just want to stay close to you this year. For anyone who can hear my voice who's feeling far from you, Lord, let them know that you're there. As they light their candle, Lord, let them think about you, the light of the world. And the light always shines brighter in the darkness. And Lord, we pray for anyone who feels alone this year that we would find out about them and that we would reach out to them, that we would be a family. Jesus, be with us. You are the greatest Christmas gift imaginable. So we want to open that gift. We want to once again receive your grace, your mercy, as you reconcile us again to God and you redeem. Thank you for these things, we pray in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now, as we close our service today, we're going to sing one last song. But before we do, wherever you're watching this from, grab a candle, find a lighter. And as you light that candle, that candle, that light represents the light of Jesus, the hope of the world, born in a world of darkness. And so let's sing, let's worship together, and we'll bless you afterwards. The stars are brightly shining. It is the night of our dear Savior's birth. Long lay the world in sin and error pining till he appeared and the soul felt its worth. A thrill of hope, a weary world rejoices for a yonder brace, a new and glorious morn fall on your knees. Oh, hear the angel voices, oh, now. Christ was born.
taught us to love one another. His law is love, and His gospel is peace. Chain shall He break, for the slave is our brother, and in His name all oppression shall cease. Sweet hymns of joy, in grateful chorus raise we, let all within us praise His holy name, Christ. Yeah. 